Hello, Tom. Very good to be interviewing you again. This interview is going to be directed toward a number of subjects, and I'd like to start with paranormal phenomena. Some questions have been raised by some of your readers. Paranormal things, why do these things happen to people, and how does it change their life? Well, let's give some examples. Um, in Boston, we had an example of a, of a lady who uh, saw images, almost like ghost-like things, in her house that she followed uh, through her house, and she got some sort of uh, valuable input and information from those. So many people have um, paranormal experiences that happen to them. They may have a precognitive dream that uh, uh, you know, comes true right to the detail. I mean, not just in a general kind of something you might have guessed at, but right to the very details of it. Uh, uh, people will sometimes have a telepathic communication, particularly between mother and child, or husband and wife, or between twins. You know, people who tend to be very close and are very open to each other. Often, people will hear a voice, they'll get some uh, information, Somebody will tell them something, something they need to do, some place they need to go, and they'll just get this, uh, uh, this knowing that they have to go somewhere, or do something, or read a particular book, and things happen. And then there's the synchronicity, where the right thing just comes along at just the right time, at just the right place, that makes a connection for them to, to uh, you know, be very important to the rest of their life. So all of these things are not that... Um, uh, rare. If you talk to, you know, I, I've, I've heard of surveys of, of the population at large of how many people have experienced something paranormal, and it's a very high percentage. I'm not sure if it's over 50 percent, but it might have been. You know, a lot of people have these experiences. You might even say most people have these kinds of experiences. So there's a couple of, uh, there's a couple of issues here. One is why you know, they say, why me? You know, why would, uh, you know, why would one person have the experience? Why did I get this experience? Why did I see this thing in my house or have this uh, experience happen to me? And the answer to that is because you were ready for it, because it was capable of showing you that there was a larger reality. And that's mainly what's going on. It's not... Uh, it's not it's a, the, the, it's delivering a great message for the ages. It's just a, like a wake-up call. Oh, guess what? You know, reality isn't just this physical reality because here's something that just happened that wouldn't happen if it was just a physical reality. You wouldn't have the precognitive dream. It would be impossible. The telepathy doesn't work like that. Um, you know, all these things that, that um, are paranormal that happen to individuals happen just as a, uh, a little nudging by the larger consciousness system to pay attention. Look, reality is more than just your physical, you know, your physical being, your physical body uh, and this, this physical world. It's larger than that. Why would the larger consciousness system want to, to uh, get that message across? Well, that helps spur those people on to be seekers. Find out why, find out more. The strange thing happened to me. And ever since then, my reality's been bigger, been broader. I read books now about it to see, to see what that was, you see. So as we've established before, the larger consciousness system evolves as we evolve. So it's in its interest to help us evolve. That's why it created this nice classroom, this nice learning lab for us, is to help us evolve gave us traction, a place where there's feedback. So it very much would like us to evolve, and it does that personally. Now I talked to a young lady last night, and she said that one day she was looking in her mirror, putting on her lipstick, and suddenly her viewpoint changed, and she was standing behind herself, kind of back and off to the right, watching herself apply the lipstick. And she could see herself, the body, she could see the body's reflection in the mirror, but yet she was neither of those. She was different. She was moved, you know, her perspective had moved off. And uh, then that happened to her again, you know, several times. And that's just a, 
It's a, just a nudge with the larger conscious system that says, look, isn't this strange? Look what's going on here. You're no longer in your body. You're no longer perceiving from a point inside your body. You're perceiving from a point outside your body. And there's no question when people have that, that it's real. They know that it's real. They know that they're not, you know, hallucinating, imagining it or whatever. It's a very real experience. So these sorts of things are very common. One other thing about the individual uh, experience of a Psy event. Some people will say, well, I've never experienced anything like that. You know, it's a bunch of hokum. I've never experienced that. If you've never experienced it, it's probably because you wouldn't be able to gain anything from it. You would deny it. You'd write it off as a hallucination. Uh, you would not, um, you're not ready to take that realization and do something with it, you see. Those people who do experience those things are people who are open to it. So if it's something that's really not going to affect the probability of your growth, you know, growing uh, to a, a, what, a, a higher quality consciousness, then there's no point in doing it. So it's not like these things just happen to everybody all the time. They happen to some people all the time and to a lot of people some of the time. And it happens to people who can benefit by that wake-up call, by that nudge. So if you'd like synchronicity and other such things to be on your path, then what you need to do is be open to them. What you need to do is, is be questioning, have a, have a sense of is the, is the reality just this physical reality, or is it larger? I wonder, and if that's a serious question of yours, then probably some events will happen to, uh, to, you know, to help you in that direction. But if your mindset is, well, that's ridiculous. Anybody that sees or hears or that says they do any of those things, you know, they're obviously just hallucinating, and uh, you know, they have weak minds and, and, and overactive uh, you know, imaginations. If that's your if that's your point, then if something like that happened to you, you would reject it immediately. You wouldn't even have the experience because the experience would be rejected. You know, rather than saying, oh, look at that, I'm looking at myself, looking at myself in the mirror, you'd say, oh, I just got a dizzy spell, you see, and then you'd pass it off and go on, you know. You wouldn't really, you wouldn't really have the experience. You'd, you'd defeat the experience before you even actually had it. So that's why some people have never had them, because some people just aren't ready for that yet. And it just wouldn't do them any good, or maybe it would frighten them. And that wouldn't be good, so they wouldn't have them. You know, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but unless it can actually help you, it's not likely to happen to you. So there's, I hear stories all the time that way. Many of your readers have said, after I read your books, your My Big Toe trilogy, all of this weird stuff began to happen. Exactly. <laughs> Do you have any particular re reason for that? Yes, for that. when they, they read the book and they do say that. Many people have said that. And the reason is, is that suddenly they've become open to it as a possibility. Before, they were closed to it as a possibility. It wasn't in their reality. Once they're open to it and they start thinking about it, and then their mind kind of wanders to it and says, gee, I wonder... You know, I wonder if, if uh, you know, if, if whatever, if I could talk to my Uncle Fred, or if this could happen or that, and they start thinking in terms of the bigger picture, then they're open, and things do start to happen to them. You know, I've had a number of people say, hey, I've read your books, and I was only halfway through, and all this weird stuff, nothing ever happened to me like that before, and now all this stuff's going on. And, uh, I yeah. can verify that, uh, that yeah. I had read books for 30 years of... Gee, that's interesting, and I, and I wonder what that's about, and are these people gifted? Is there anything special about them that they are able to do this out of body or have a psychic experience? Mm -hmm. And halfway through your book, absolutely everything opened up. Clairvoyance, clairaudience, past lives, psychic visions, every possibility. So I guess I was open to all of it. Mm -hmm. Insights into past lives. All of that was available. All of that happened in a succession and in 3D, in color. Things that you never, that you know are real. In fact, 
not only do you know they're real, they're more, f they're more fundamental than the things that you know about here yeah. on this earthly existence. Yeah. Well, you know they're real. You, you can differentiate between things that are real and things that are not, and things that you might imagine and things that you don't. There's a different quality to those things, and it's, it just comes out that way. The reason my book tends to do that more than a lot of other books is that a lot of other books are in the form of, here's my experience or here's what I believe. Well, that's just that person's experience and what they believe. The, the reader doesn't necessarily identify with that with themselves, but my books are, here's how it works. Look, guys, this is science. This is just natural. It's the way the world is. It's just the nature of reality, and it shows up in double-slit experiments and, and um, you know, science and at pair labs, and it shows up you know, all over the place. And they kind of see the connections, and it's like, oh, well, this is not really, you know, woo-woo, you know, paranormal, weird stuff that nobody actually believes in. This is just the nature of reality. Oh, okay. So then that really does open them up to the possibility that, uh, you know, these things might happen. As opposed to, well, like you say, that person must be gifted. So-and-so can, can, can see past lives, but I could never do that. It's once it becomes just a natural part of the environment, just like gravity and rainfall, then it's more empowering of the individual that, well, I could do that. You know, I'm conscious, I could do that. And at that point, it becomes more available to them. It's just yeah. an opening. That's a very important point, what you just said, empowering the individual. That's what your books do. It doesn't say, look what I've found, do what I do this is the method for doing this. It is first and foremost science and empowerment of the individual and that's what I find and, and, I've, and other people find so valuable. I think at, at a certain point where people have read, read books and understood this and were ready for it, as soon as they hit your book and realize, okay, well this is what I've been looking for. This is science. This is possible. There it is. Right. I'm a human being. I have consciousness. I can, you know, I can do these things. These things can happen to me. These can be my experience. It's not, you don't have to be special chosen one. All you have to do is, is have the will and the interest and, uh, and you can uh, have these experiences. That's why I tell people in the books, you know, please don't, uh, you know, believe what I say. I don't want this to be a matter of belief. Go experience it. It's not, it can't be your personal truth till it's your personal experience. Go have a personal experience. And that, uh, a lot of people think, well, I couldn't, until they realize, well, it's just science. You can walk in the rain, you know. You can do it if you want to. Um, paranormal events aren't really paranormal, which means beyond normal. They're just normal events in the larger reality. They only appear to be outside of normal from a belief in an objective you know, our objective physical reality. From that narrow viewpoint, which we find out is only an approximation, it's a small subset of a larger reality. It's just an approximation like flat earth and Newtonian physics. So from that little subset, it seems like it's paranormal. But that little subset is just a piece of, the, of reality. It's just a piece of the way um, you know, nature works. And there is this larger viewpoint from which you can understand the physics and the metaphysics and the paranormal becomes normal. I think when you say larger viewpoint, it was interesting yesterday at Unity's presentation, uh, Richard Burdick, who is head of the Unity North Church in Atlanta, made a point on the panel of drawing from scriptures. He's, they're not coming from a religious viewpoint and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not either, but it's interesting that the universal messages in scriptures, for instance, his, his pointing out, when you were speaking of multiple realities, he pointed out there are many mansions in my father's house and how it, how it corresponds. I think the universal message that Jesus had is there. I think people have, are not looking into the universal messages that are there they are confining it perhaps too much because 
a universal message of what you said about the seeker, seek and ye shall find. That's from the scriptures. If you take it in a universal sense, I think you're looking into the true messages that are there that he wished to have for everyone. And it was in a, a broader sense than it, than it is perhaps interpreted today. Yeah, and you would have to say that was true also of Krishna and Buddha and All you know, of those. many, many other uh, uh, people who contributed a great deal to the understanding of the larger, of the real, larger reality. And we can find lots of those little sayings. Um, you know, you reap what you sow. Well, you know, that's karma, isn't it? God is love. Well, that sounds like it's uh, Buddhist and, and Hindu both and so on. Yes, people, people have understood the truth. You know, like I say often, there's just one truth. And there are thousands of ways of expressing that truth and of working toward that truth and of understanding that truth. So we have had for the last 4,000 years people who have had all of that truth or some of that truth or just pieces of it and they've come from a hundred you know, or a thousand different paths and they're all working toward the same thing. I and think that's good and it all works together. You know, it's not it like we need to just find the right one. You know, that's not the point. There is no right one. Whichever one you resonate with, whichever one talks to you, whichever one uses the metaphors and symbols that, that suit you, then that's a good one for you to, to go because all of these paths are leading to the same truth. Now some of them will take you all the way. Some of these paths will only take you part way toward the truth. Well that's fine. Take the part that you know that, that talks to you and then move on and find another another path that still uh, you know holds promise for you. So I think it's very interesting that Yogananda was an Eastern, an Eastern yogi from an Eastern philosophy. He took a great interest in the scriptures and in pulling out those universal messages and in mm -hmm. trying to correlate them to the Eastern philosophy and show how what you just said, all of those messages tell the same thing. Yeah. All of the paths lead the same way. So yeah. I think if it's everything is taken in a universal sense, you find the same path to truth. Yes, and of course on these paths there's also lots of uh, barriers, lots of, uh, well, barriers, what's that, dogma? You know, there's, there's lots of uh, rocks to, to have to walk around and ditches to have to go over, uh, but that's just the way it is. You know, people have littered the paths with their own ideas, their, their own uh, prescriptions, their own tool sets, but you have to grow up enough to, to recognize that and not necessarily throw away the path because other people have littered it. You know, you just kind of take what's there for you, take what's good for you. And uh, like I say, you, you, you get to a part and one path that you're on and you say, this really isn't, I, I don't really feel I'm still growing from this direction anymore. Then find another direction, find another tool set find another way of, of looking at it. Because all of these paths don't lead all the way to the whole truth. But there's thousands of paths that at least lead toward it. And uh, you know, if you look at uh, you know, mental healing, healing others with the mind, there's probably 200 different ways to do that. There's probably 200 different groups that would be glad to take your money to heal you doing different kinds of things. Many of them are effective for some people. You know, all of them are probably effective for some people. You know, there's some of them that are effective for many people. It's just their tools and tool sets. The only active ingredient is conscious intent. That's what they all boil down to, is some way of applying conscious intent. Well, people who uh, have certain um, experiences and metaphors and, and uh, cultural backgrounds, beliefs, fears, whatever, then this methodology suits them better. That kind of, they can connect with that better. Would you qualify that to say focused, practiced intent? Sure. Um, as opposed to, A, I, I wish you well, I have thoughts for you to heal, those sorts sure. of things. This is a very finely focused intent that you're speaking yes, of. Yes, yes, there's a difference. Um, one of the analogies I used before is that if you, if you make a wish, if you uh, have a 
just have an intent that the way you'd like something to be, that's sort of like the sunshine coming in a window. You know, it, it has some effect. You know, it'll warm you some. But if you have a focused, a clear focused intent, that's like collecting all of that sunshine in a big magnifying glass and focusing to a point that can actually melt metal, you know, start fires, uh, something that has a lot of power. And there's a difference. So intent is intent. So even a casual, gee, I wish it wouldn't rain today, you know, will have some minor effect, you know, but it's not going to move mountains. It's not going to have a very large effect. Although if you had maybe 10,000 people all saying, I wish it wouldn't rain today, you know, that might add up a little bit, but still the effects are weak. But if you have someone who has their, their consciousness focused, which means you get rid of all the noise, get rid of all the idle thoughts that are running through your mind to where you're just a, a point of consciousness floating in the void. That means you have no input through your senses that you're, that you're giving any attention to. You're just consciousness and you have a very specific thing you'd like to do. And if the specific thing you'd like to do is something that is going to help yourself or others grow the quality of their consciousness, then that's even better yet, you see, because now you're, you're kind of working in the direction that the system wants to go in. So the system now is cooperative with you. So, yes, it, a focused intent makes all the difference in the world. You know, many people who, uh, who uh, say pray, you know, praying is just a wish list to them. Oh, let's, you know, take care of this, take care of that, you know, um, do this for me, do that. It's, it's sort of, you know, asking daddy, you know, for what, you, what, you, what you'd like to have. You know, and that kind of idle wishing doesn't really work much. But then there's other people who can get into a state of, of, of uh, what can we call it, um, you know, in, in the, in the um, Eastern religions, they may say a, a state of bliss. You know, they might say it that way. That's basically point consciousness. You know, they'll get into, uh, and some religious people will say they get into a state of rapture. You know, there's lots of different names for it, but basically what that means is you focus your awareness, you focus your consciousness, and you no longer are connected, I shouldn't say connected, you're no longer uh, interacting with, you're no longer operating on all the sense data, you're no longer judging, you're not second guessing, you're not um, trying to analyze, you've told the intellect to sit down and be quiet, it's just you at your fundamental being level, it's a basic level of your core, existing as conscious point. That's the, that's the point consciousness in the void, whether that's rapture or whether, you know, however, or, or the state of bliss, however you want to say it, that's the idea. And once you get to that point, now you can focus your consciousness to some end, focus your intent to some, to some end. But if that end then is egotistical, or harmful to others, or arrogant, then what happens is that that is ego and fear, and it will tend to raise your entropy, and even if you have some limited success, you'll be, you'll be very limited in your efforts, and you may even start to backslide, and, and, and after a while, it, you get less and less effective at it, because you're really pushing the system against, you know, you're working against the grain, I guess, of the, of the larger consciousness system, and that just isn't very productive. And here by entropy, for some who have not listened to all of your lectures, all of them are out there on YouTube, the science of them is in, uh, very well represented in the Calgary YouTube. Explain entropy, because I know that's a physics term. Okay, well yeah, this, this little uh, interview and conversation is kind of picking up in the middle. I'm kind of assuming that people have already looked at uh, some of the videos that are on YouTube. Entropy is a physics term, comes out of thermodynamics. It is a measure of disorder. That's one way to describe it. It's a measure of disorder. So if you have high entropy, you have lots of disorder. If you have low entropy, you have less disorder or more order, more structure. Well, that's one view of, of entropy. Uh, also, uh, an alternate and a, an equivalent 
way of saying it is that when you have lower entropy, you have a greater, and in physics you would say, a greater ability to do work. That means you have structure, something that can accomplish something. You see, when you have randomness, when you have all disorder, which is randomness, randomness can't accomplish anything. But you build structure, you build uh, uh, content in information, or you build uh, um, some sort of structural thing. Let's say a lot of uh, molecules start to form up in a crystal. You see, in that process of these molecules, which kind of randomly just kind of moving around, and they start to form themselves up into crystals. So that crystal is a lower entropy expression of those molecules before they were randomly moving around. So um, that would be a kind of a, an example of a spontaneous reduction of entropy, where you have a system that has the potential to produce something other than randomness, and it just happens. For some reason, it just starts and then it builds on itself and happens. That emergent complexity is similar to what happens when you have a crystal. You know, you have, a, you have uh, molecules that have the potential to do something and something happens. Some little seed point starts to crystal moving and then after that it all, you know, the, the molecules kind of build on it and, and build, up the, build up the structure. So that's the nature of entropy and uh, a low entropy consciousness is defined as love because love is the lowest entropy state in which conscious entities can interact with each other. So as you interact with other entities, interacting with love and caring is your optimal state for creating content, for creating structure, for creating something of value. Whereas fear is a very high entropy uh, attitude or a very high entropy thing. And if you relate, if beings relate to each other with fear, that tends to be a destructive, tearing apart it's all about me, uh, I don't trust you, I fear you, you know, and that doesn't build or go anywhere. That's just self-destructive. So that's, that's, you know, how I use entropy. Uh, and of course, the, you would say, I imagine that the value of lowering your entropy and the value of a low entropy being is that it is more in alignment with what you call the larger consciousness system right. and what others may call God. Right. Well, the larger consciousness system is just a natural system. It's finite. It's a natural system just like uh, the ecosystem or just like uh, you know, the monetary system or just like any other large complex system. It's just a natural system and it's evolving. And it evolves by lowering its entropy. Most everything evolves by lowering its entropy. Uh, everything evolves by restructuring, becoming, becoming uh, more suitable to its environment, right? That's what evolution does. You become more, more successful in your environment. In, a physical, in our physical world, looking at physical things, procreation and survival are the things that succeed. Because if you don't procreate and you don't have an infinite lifespan and you don't procreate, then you will die off and go away. So that's important. And if you don't survive, obviously you, you go away. So survival and procreation are the, are the criteria for success in this physical reality. Well, in the larger consciousness system, the criteria for success is, is uh, lowering entropy in a form of forming content forming meaning. See, it's an information system. The larger consciousness system is a digital information system. The way information evolves is to form content. The way it de-evolves is to move toward randomness. You know, dissolve meaning. Let all the ones and zeros just become random rather than going together to form patterns that have significance. So, if you are going to evolve, you have to move toward a lower entropy state. If you're a consciousness system and you have uh, lots of pieces, individuated units of consciousness interacting each, with each other, the way you evolve is to have those interactions be love-based rather than fear-based. That produces your optimal interaction, if you will, between beings. So that's the way it's moving. So the larger consciousness system itself is evolving toward love. So if you, 
as an individual or just a piece of that system, that's part of the way the larger system evolves toward love is that you evolve toward love. In other words, we're part of the substance of the system. We're part of the process of the whole system evolving. As we move toward love, the whole system does because we're it and it's us. See, we're just pieces of that consciousness system and that's really our job is to grow up and we can call it lots of things to grow up to uh, what to have spiritual growth to improve the quality of your consciousness to decrease the entropy of your consciousness these all mean the same sort of thing you know they're just said in, in different terms and you to you know mature your being might be another way to all say right. that well thank you for that i know we began the interview with you describing how paranormal phenomena affects individuals' lives. Can you tell us now how it affects us collectively? Yes. Um, yeah, we sort of established that paranormal um, events and happenings to individuals are just like wake-up calls, just little nudges to help demonstrate to those individuals that reality is bigger than just the physical. And that's kind of the, the reason for it. And the system does that just to to help those individuals on a path toward evolving themselves. And it does it because their evolution is the system's evolution. So we've kind of come back and tied all that together. Well, it doesn't just happen on an individual level. There's lots of, of uh, kind of uh, collective, we can say collective uh, level, but levels in which groups of people kind of get that nudge together. And I can think of, uh, you know, we can probably together come up with, you know, half a dozen examples of that. Now, what happens most of the time is when that is when we have a, a, um, a kind of a collective nudging, if you will, with a larger consciousness system, people who don't understand consciousness, don't understand the nature of reality, don't understand that this is a virtual informational reality, they have a tendency to want to explain those happenings with some kind of physical phenomena, even if the physical is kind of strange or some sort of physical-like structure. So what happens is that we have things, for instance, we'll take an example. Look at the crop circles. Okay, these crop circles are patterns within grain fields, you know, fields of grass or grain that are growing and then we have some very intricate patterns and these patterns sometimes show up overnight you know and the patterns would be very difficult to make in a week with a lot of people making a lot of noise but these will show up on a quiet night you know where there were people around but nobody heard or saw anything or sometimes they might see the little lights moving around whatever and the next you know four hours later when the sun comes up here's this you know 25 acre you know pattern that has very intricate designs in it and um, they are mysterious enough that there are groups of scientists from various places that study them and try to uh, determine what might have happened and who might have done it and of course you'll always find a couple of people who want to go out and prank and try to do something like that but those are rather obvious and they the scientists there have, have uh, concluded that there's something strange going on here. You know, it's something that we really can't pinpoint. We really can't understand. You know, all the grass, all the, the, the weed or whatever it is has been bent over a certain way with a little black substance here, which looks like if it was heat. And, and they've done a lot of analysis of it. And it uh, just doesn't lend itself to a good explanation. So what happens is that people look at it and say, well, obviously, something major and massive happened here. We're talking about 10 acres or 20 acres or some massive pattern. And uh, if it wasn't, if humans couldn't do it, that's one of the conclusions they come to, that with all our technology, and you know, if we had, if we spent, you know, $20 million and tried to make a pattern in a few hours with no noise in the middle of the night, and no lights, you know, could we do this? And basically, it's like it would be very, very difficult. And it would, cause, it would need so many people and so much equipment that it couldn't be done in a field that nobody heard, saw, anything. You know, 
the circumstances under which it happens makes it virtually impossible that humans could have produced it. Well, if it wasn't humans producing it, somebody had to produce it. Oh, it must be extraterrestrials, you know, it must be ETs are producing it. That's the, that's the explanation. Well, you get that explanation because people don't understand the reality they live in. They think they live in an objective physical reality. So some other physical kind of beings, not human, must have done it. Well, that's ETs, you know, so then right away, crop circles are, you know, are proof of extraterrestrials coming here and playing games with us, doing these, these things. Well, if they understood the nature of reality, they would see that we live in a virtual reality to begin with. It's not physical. It's just data. The larger consciousness system basically has set up and created this virtual reality for consciousness to experience and to grow up in. And as you know, if you're familiar with simulations, you can have a simulation, just do anything you want. You know, simulations are simulations. You know, even in the games people play, there's always these, uh, um, what do they call it, cheat codes. You know, things that make unusual things happen. I remember my, my children playing um, Age of Empires. It was, a, it was a game of really kind of cultural evolution. But if you knew the cheat code and people were kind of beating you up, you know, it's like warring different, different groups of people. If you knew the cheat codes, you could materialize a Mercedes Benz with, an, with a nuclear warhead launcher on it and you could drive around in your Mercedes Benz and blow up all of your enemies, you see. And this was a cheat code. So in virtual realities, Anything, anything goes. Now, to have a good schoolhouse like ours, you can't have the sort of you know cheat code going on all the time and letting the players do it isn't a good idea, you know. But the point is that in a virtual reality that's informational, the larger consciousness system, who is you know the the uh, creator of the game, if you will, and and has all the information, can pretty well do whatever it likes as far as manifesting things that happen here. So it wants to nudge individuals and sometimes, like we talked with uh, Eliza Medhouse, in that case that individual then spread it to thousands of others. But often it's just for the individual's use. It doesn't spread much. It's that individual may talk to a few people, but mostly they don't talk to anybody. They're not going to tell anybody. The lady that told me about appearing behind and above herself, watching herself apply lipstick in, you know, in front of a mirror, she says, I've never told anybody about that, you know, so most people don't share that because if I told you that, you'd think I was, you know, you'd think less of me. Oh, they don't have a, they have a screw loose. They really don't have a firm grip on reality. You know, they're prone to hallucinations. So most people don't mention it. They keep it to themselves. Well, you could see that uh, the larger conscious system might want to do a few things that were public not just individual, but we're public enough that we get people's attention that there's something bigger than just this physical reality because just this physical reality isn't going to produce those crop cycles. You know, scientists have pretty well said that mm, it doesn't happen here because it's too hard to do. We can't do that without lots of people and lots of noise and lot, you, know, you can't do that secretly in a few hours in the middle of the night, particularly when there's dozens of people scattered around in these fields with cameras and things just watching to see what might happen. You know, there's lots of observers out there and it happens anyway, right in front of them. And sometimes they have, uh, you know, they'll look with their cameras and they'll see little spots of light running around in, in the fields, you know, they'll see this, but they hear nothing. Uh, and then the next day, of course, when the, when the dawn comes, you know, here's this, you know, 15 acre pattern laid out. Well, so, the larger consciousness system, this is Tom Campbell's view, the larger consciousness system is producing these kind of effects in order to help wake up people. Reality is a lot stranger, a lot larger than you think, you know, and it does. Even though people jump to the conclusion about, well, then it must be aliens because in their mind it has to be some, if it's not this physical, you know, a race of people, then it must be some other, something comes from somewhere else that does it, because obviously some sort of beings have to do it.
Well, of course, that's not true. They're, they're trapped in a belief that nothing can be done if beings don't do it. Um, well, at least physical beings don't do it. So anyway, the larger consciousness system can produce those kinds of things. Now, we have lots of other things that uh, happen kind of on a grander scale. We have um, uh, energy points that are various places. And they have a lot of history about, you know, how they got there and what they do. And these are just things that have been created by the larger consciousness system to help people see that there's a larger reality. You know? And it's not that, that uh, you know, these things don't exist or whatever, but they, they uh, are there for a reason. And the reason is to, the same as why somebody suddenly gets a message from their Uncle Fred on their answering machine. You know, that happens. Uncle Fred's been dead for, for 10 years, and suddenly, uh, you know, the phone rings, maybe, and a person picks up and he says, Hi, I'm your Uncle Fred, and da, 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 they have a conversation with him, and, and then it, you know, it ends, and the people think, Did I just imagine that? You know, was that just my imagination, or what? Because it's, you can't explain it. Well, these things happen. It, sometimes it comes in over a fax, or some, a picture, will, you know, appear on a fax machine. You know, so we've got lots of those sorts of individual things. Now, these things um, that you're describing, um, that would also include aliens, alien abductions, UFO sightings, those kinds of things. Many of those kinds of things, yes. UFO sightings, other things that uh, they just, they open people's minds. If you, uh, if you open your mind to something greater than just what, is in normal normally in our culture, right? Which is you know we have this universe as far as we know we're the only people, you know we're the only people in it. Although the probability is there are others, other places is a higher is a much higher probability. But as far as we know, it's just us, and it's you know this physical our our solar system, you know our universe, and that's kind of the where science leaves it. Science won't go past that point, and the culture kind of picks up on that, and that's their attitude, you know, this is it, this little physical reality we know is it, that's all there is to reality, period. And these things kind of jar people into saying, no, it's bigger than that. It's, you know, there's other dimensions, there's other things, it's larger. And if people then jump to the conclusions that it's aliens, as opposed to it's working, you know, in consciousness. Now people will wake up and there's an alien standing at their bed, right? Well, that tends, in my mind, is probably they're doing that in a altered state, if you will, although it doesn't seem that way. Altered states can seem just as real as the awake state. You don't know that. Also, the larger consciousness system can just have that happen, just like the Mercedes-Benz with the nuclear launcher. It can just create that image for you to give you a, you know, something, uh, something else. It's bigger than what you think. I think we should clarify. Um, I know this is your, this is your philosophy. You say from your viewpoint, mm -hmm. you know, from Tom's viewpoint. Your my big toe books are science, metaphysics, physics, philosophy. This is your, this is your philosophy of how, of, of your model of how things work. But I think we should clarify something, and we've, we've touched on this before, but for this particular interview, that you are not just coming from a philosophical viewpoint on these things. This is not just your opinion. You have researched every aspect of what you have put into your books yourself, because not only are you the scientist, which is what you are here first and foremost, but you are also the consciousness explorer and you have verified your own work from the outside in. Can you uh, yeah, that's, comment that's, that's on that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, I could never have arrived at the My Big Toe theory had I not been able to do experiments and had uh, kind of unfettered access to the larger consciousness system because I wouldn't have been able to make the the leap. I wouldn't have been able to do, have the, you know, to have gone beyond, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the belief system here. Unless you have that entree, you know, the larger consciousness system, it would be very difficult to take that step, um, particularly as a scientist, it would be very hard to do that. 
So yes, that's true, and I have, I have done that, and this is science. But on the other hand, I also have to say, I don't have all the answers necessarily, and I don't have all the data, and I haven't had all the experiences. And I don't mean to imply that people who have had experiences with alien encounters or whatever, that their experiences, you know, aren't just as they, just as they uh, feel they are. Okay? That's not my point. Um, I'm not denying that any of that exists. I'm just saying that some of it, at least, you know, is probably due to the consciousness system. The consciousness system can play alien if it wants to. You see, the consciousness system can be, you know, a little green man with pointy ears, or, you know, whatever the other images we have, right? That's, I guess, an old image, you know. Now we have greys and reptilians and other kinds of things. But the larger consciousness system can play all those parts very easily. We live in a virtual reality, we get a data stream, and anything can be inserted in your data stream, and that's the reality that you have when you get things inserted in your data stream. So, and it's just as real as this reality, because this physical reality is just data inserted in your data stream, so there's really no different. And the consciousness system can play all those parts, and the reason to play those parts is just to wake people up to a larger thing, so to open their mind, expand the possibilities in their mind, because if you have your mind expanded in one area, even if that's a UFO area, it's easier to have it expanded in other areas. So it's part of the process of nudging people to think in terms of bigger pictures. So it's not that these people are having experiences and it's not really what they think and they don't know, you know, whatever. They have their experiences. Their experience is their experience. And it's as real and as viable as the experience of walking around in this physical reality is real and viable. But it's all just data. And they don't, you know, once we get data, we interpret it. So we interpret the data in terms of our knowledge, in terms of our fear, in terms of our beliefs, in terms of our experience, you know, in terms of our culture. That's how we interpret the data. And if we interpret the data as aliens, well, that's our interpretation. If we interpret it, you know, as who knows what, you know, something else, then that's our interpretation. So it's everything we get is just an interpretation of data. There is nothing that we perceive that isn't an interpretation of data. And our interpretations are all personal. So that's, that's kind of the bottom line. Now, I, I'm always uh, espousing open-minded skepticism. And I'm entirely open-minded that some things may be, you know, um, may not be the way that I'm saying them. Because this is my interpretation, you see. This is how I interpret the data. I think it's important to state that your interpretation is coming from a much bigger, because of your experience, your extensive experience with the larger consciousness system and science, your interpretation is coming from a much bigger viewpoint than most people's. And that you, I don't think, would propose an idea or a concept without having tested it out yourself. Well, and if it weren't viable and, and part of, if it didn't fit well within this uh, mm -hmm. scientific model, yes, these are things that fit in the scientific model. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make them, you know, the way I present them, but they do fit within the scientific model. And all of that uh, my big toe is is a model. It's a way of looking at reality. And if, it ha if the value in it is that it ties things together so that one understanding explains many, many things. It may just be an individual. One individual may be given skills, let's say to heal. And that individual then may go around and heal thousands of people and get tens of thousands of people watching the videos and finding out about it and whatever. And that individual is responsible for nudging awake tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. And how is it that he just ended up with those skills? Well, maybe another part of the larger consciousness system's demonstration, if you will, that reality is more than what you think it is. You see, there's lots of things like that. So it's not just necessarily crop circles, but uh, 
There was a there was a video on YouTube. There was a fellow who was kind of out of the jungles of, or out of the the, the uh, rural area of Indonesia, maybe someplace in the east. A German camera crew came and talked to him, and he could take his hands and start a fire. And he took a straw, and pushed it through a wooden table, and he did a few other things like that that he demonstrated for the cameras. And uh, as best that anybody could tell, it was all very legitimate, but. Uh, he said that uh, his master, who was not, I think, a physical being, but a non-physical being, told him that he should go share these things, you see. So he then calls the camera crew up and says, here, let me show you some things. They make the camera crew, and then the guy disappears back into the, you know, back into wherever he came from, and uh, it's gone. Well, why did that happen? And this guy used the energy key, right? It's his energy. Chi. And he did it through meditation and concentration, and he'd spend his lifetime, you know, meditating and doing these kinds of things. But he does these demonstrations because he's got the message that it would be a good thing to do. And uh, in any case, that's, you know, the larger consciousness system creating a situation that spreads the nudges, if you will, to lots and lots of people. So we, we tend to think of these things as just isolated little happenings. You know, is this an isolated event? Here's some guy walks out of you know a jungle in Asia, Indonesia and very casually does all these things that nobody else can do, and thousands of people go, "Wow, look at that!" There was a movie that uh, Matrix Tyson that he showed, and it was back in the I don't know late 1800s, early 1900s. There was a guy who stuck swords through himself. Really a gruesome thing that should have been fatal. And he did this with demonstrations. He was a guy, perfectly unremarkable clerk or, you know, attorney or something someplace, and then kind of out of nowhere, you know, normal kind of childhood, and then out of nowhere he uh, has a, uh, I don't know, it wasn't like a near-death experience, but he had some kind of major sort of experience. And after that, he's changed. And he goes around in front of crowds, running himself through with uh, swords that go in and come out the other side, you know. And all of those things were should have been fatal, but uh, he gets over them. That's something like the uh, martial arts masters who can, like Dennis Snederick does, chop through a concrete block, almost like that physical object isn't there, I think mm -hmm. is the mental concept right. of that, and so, that must be the same with the sword. Yeah, so this, these things are, are dramatic things that, that kind of demonstrate the power of mind, if you will. They demonstrate the power of consciousness, and that this reality isn't just the physical reality that the scientists would have you believe, because otherwise things don't, you know, can't happen that there's way. A, there's a wonderful young man in Toronto, Adam called Dream Healer, and he brings in a huge audiences to demonstrate his healing abilities. He had as a child, very early as a child, it started with him healing his mother's muscular dystrophy, and he simply had these talents, and now he's a young uh, medical student in medical school trying to integrate his healing ability with traditional medicine, and I think he's, he's a, an example of one of those people who is showing the masses of the, that right. this kind of thing is we are more than what than what we appear to be, and that you can do these things. He does also empower other people by showing him look, and he gives them scientific ways of doing things. He has things called the smart packet of healing exercise, and it's very it's very scientifically done and well done. But this has impacted a lot of people sure. into the larger yeah, reality. Yeah, the, I guess the point we were making with all of this is that mm -hmm. we have these phenomena, these kind of unexplainable phenomena. Sometimes they're personal, like a precognitive dream. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're like an individual, like Adam. Uh, sometimes they're things like, you know, the, you know, the crop circles. Uh, there's, there's, there's things, mm -hmm. and our tendency is to say, there's some physical, you know, what's the physical cause for that? There must be a physical cause. Well, if it isn't human or the earthly physical cause, then it must be aliens are physically doing it. 
some invisible ship that comes over and stamps out crop circles, you see, and things like that. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but look, something physical had to, had to do it, right? So it's either these aliens, or it's us, or it's, you know, it's, it's farmers from the area playing jokes on the rest of us. You know, we have to make some kind of physical explanation. And I guess the whole point of our discussion is that's not necessarily the way it works. You live in a virtual reality. There is not necessarily going to be a physical explanation for these unexplainable things. It may just be the larger consciousness system giving us a nudge to show us that, that reality is bigger. We take people like Adam and we say, well, they're just, you know, um, some kind of unusual, some kind, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mystical, it's kind of a magical event that somebody just was kind of born with those kinds of things, you know, those kinds of abilities and whatever, and the people, the guy who ran himself through swords, you know, these strange people pop up, but see, they pop up through all the time. You go back a hundred years and there were people doing things like that, people levitating other people, and it wasn't magic tricks, you know, there were lots of people that, you know, I don't know, the, the, the science of the time, you know, looked at it and couldn't understand it. We've had these, I couldn't understand it things going on forever. It's not just now, and that seems like it's a natural extension of what we see with individuals and what we see all over. It's, it's part of living in a virtual reality as a part of a larger consciousness system that interacts with us to help us evolve, which is helping itself I think evolve. Yes, and I think that all of the um, enlightened beings who were sent here to help us go back to scripture again, which is not my forte and not where I come from, but I think it's interesting to note all these things I do, you can do also. That is a, a quote out of scripture that needs to be taken that's, that's a universal message. It needs to be taken at a universal level. This is what these beings, even though this was ancient times, this was said to help people try to understand that who they were. What they were. They All, were I'm not special. Yeah. All these things I do, you can do also. That was out of Scripture, and I think that is kind of what you are hinting at with these uh, paranormal experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think that the interesting, an interesting note to make also from a, as a conclusion is that your my big toe theory ties all of this together. These are not isolated specialties, healing, psychics, um, different things like that. All of this phenomena fits into what you've presented in your model of reality. Yeah, it's all part of one picture. You know, I would, I would uh, kind of guess or project that uh, you know, somebody might say, well, why crop circles, you know, uh, that sort of thing. And, well, the, those kinds of demonstrations are the, for, like we started saying in the beginning of this, those kinds of demonstrations are, the, are for the people who can use it, for the people who can do something with it as far as their own personal growth. Um, the majority of people can't use it, particularly in Western culture. They reject it. So these crop circles have been around for how many decades? Right? And it's still a fringe item, even though science says this is impossible. The belief is, oh, some farmers with, you know, rakes and shovels go out and, you know, knock that stuff down and what, you know, well, that doesn't fly, of course, that's a ridiculous suggestion, but that's enough to help most people keep their fears and their beliefs together, you know, it, uh, you know, that's it's kind of a, let's not go there, we know that's crazy and we know that's hokey because it has to be, because it's outside of my belief system, so I won't deal with it. So most of the people don't accept that. And that's one of the reasons why it can exist. You see, it was, it's there just for the people who can use it. And over the number of decades that that's been going on, there's been, no doubt, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who know about it and have used it to open their minds to something larger. 
But let's say that the the um, what do I call it the dominant culture, dominant culture press, dominant culture talking heads. You know, it, let's say that they all got on board. They all said, "Oh yeah, look, crop circles, impossible, but here they are," and and whatever. They probably stop happening. You see, their purpose wouldn't be there anymore. Their purpose is a wake-up nudge to those who are ready for it. If it suddenly became mainstream, it'd probably disappear. You probably wouldn't see any of it anymore. The purpose would be gone. So it's only there because it serves a purpose. And the purpose can only be served in the margins. You see, it's not, you don't want to convince a lot of people who aren't ready at an intellectual level that just creates, that's just going to create more trouble. We'll end up then learning the science of how mind controls things and pretty soon we'll be in a very nasty society where everybody's trying to control everybody else with their mind. We don't need this as a widespread understanding. We need it just among those who can grow from it, you see. So it's there and it's, it's nudging people who are making some use of it, but it's not being accepted in the larger society where then it, the, it could be abused. You know, the knowledge of mind and that, that intent modifies probable future, you know, those kinds of things. You don't want that as, a, as an accepted idea or you'll end up like the societies that, that are along, say, the east and west coast of Africa where, where individuals will uh, threaten each other with what they can do to harm them with their minds. You know, it's sort of the voodoo mentality, if you will. They yes. call it. They call it different things. Voodoo, I think, is something that comes out of uh, Haiti or some some of those places. Mm -hmm. But there's similar kinds of things where mental structure, where mind affects matter, is used very negatively by people who have not grown, and that can be done. But you don't want that to take hold in a larger society. So you don't want the larger society who's not ready to grow, who's still full of fear and ego to really accept these ideas. So they happen in the margins to wake up the people who are ready to wake up. The rest of the society who says, oh, that's ridiculous, they kind of need to have that attitude, if you will. We need them to have that attitude because they're not ready yet. If they had the tool, they're likely to misuse it. Perhaps there was a civilization. We don't know whether Atlantis existed or not, but there are hints of an advanced civilization such as Atlantis where we were more in touch with the larger reality and things like that did happen and that self-destruction self yeah. yeah you don't want the tools that a person has to get out in front to be bigger and and stronger than the quality of the consciousness that's controlling those tools you see so it's better to have these things kind of bubbling up in the margins nudging people on to bigger ideas but uh, kind of staying, staying there in the margins. As long as they do, then they're useful. And for some reason, for some unusual magic reason, the press, say, doesn't do anything at all with crop circles. When's the last time you've heard you know, a new crop circle reported in uh, you know, the, the New York Times or the, the Wall Street Journal or you know, the London Times or something like that? Never, see, the press ignores it entirely. Why do they ignore it entirely? There's scientists out there by the dozens studying it and doing things. All their reports, ignore it entirely. It's ignored entirely. I think they have the idea that they need to ignore it. That uh, that's, that's part of the sense that they get. That it's not, it's not something that can be told to the public. Not that they're keeping it from the public, but they themselves just kind of have the sense of you don't say that in public, you know. People would think you were nuts if you thought that that was, you know, there was something real going on there. So there's a, there's kind of a built-in reluctance to create that problem. It's a, kind of an intuition, if you will. So the, the larger society ignores these things. That's what allows them to stay and to be there and to be effective for the those of us who can get something out of them. And basically it's just a demonstration and saying, 
Reality is bigger than you think. The physical thing is not the only thing going on here. Open your mind. Put your mind in a bigger box. You know, you're in a little box. Let's expand your box a bit because the bigger that box is expanded, even if it's expanded toward a UFO explanation, it's still expanded. And it's easier then to accept other things that are that are larger. So it's it's all part of the part of the way things are done in this uh, digital information system, this virtual reality, you know, that uh, that we that we live in. Thank so you. that that kind of all ties a lot of things together, you know, from magic places on the ground, what vortex is here and there, and why they're there, and so on. And have all this this theory for people like Adam and people like you know some. Some guy in uh, you know Peru will you know walk out of the jungle and he heals and he does surgery and he does all these kinds of things and what's all this weird stuff you know and why is it going on well weird stuff like that's going on always going on and you know why why does it happen why did I have that precognitive dream why did I suddenly see myself putting on my lipstick in the mirror you know why does that why did these things happen why did that ghostly kind of thing come through my house and do what it did which was impossible. You know, why, 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 you know, all these things that happened. How is it that I, I knew that my child was hurt? You know, and I, I immediately jumped in the car and went to school to see, and you know, sure enough, you know, they were hurt. How do those things happen? Why do they happen? Lol, uh, an engineer friend of mine saw the, a bunch of people in an airplane before it crashed. And one little girl, out of all the passengers, was in color. There was one survivor, and it was a little girl. You see, and he knew that. He saw the whole situation a day or two before the crash happened. And it completely rearranged his life, completely changed his worldview in the sense that now he couldn't deny it. He's an engineer that, you know, was just located in a physical reality, and suddenly he knew that reality was stranger. And that put him on a path to find out. So that's why these things happen. That's why somebody gets a, a fax on their machine from somebody that's been dead for you know a couple of years, and uh, somebody will hear voices in a radio that's tuned between stations where there's nothing station, and suddenly you know some sort of voice comes out. There's all sorts of mechanisms like that. And of course we blow it all off with somebody's imagination, but that's not the case. It's not that all these people are crazy and they're all making it up and they're all having hallucinations. These things happen. And they're just nudges and wake-ups and they'll share it to a few friends or maybe they'll keep it to themselves or whatever. It all happens in the margins. As long as it happens in the margins, it doesn't really cause us any great difficulty. So that's kind of a tie all that and I wish we could list a couple of other things. I don't know what they are, but there's probably dozens and dozens of these, wow, isn't that strange? How could that possibly have happened? Isn't that weird? And well, look at the um, app apparitions in uh, Lourdes and Fatima, things yes. like that. Those are from back 100 years. Um, right, and those are in a religious context. Because religious the religious context. people, they need to be nudged too. too. You know, exactly. it's that sort of stuff. And you have the... Uh, you know, the, um, who was it, Danikin, who did the, uh, um, looked at various things on the earth that obviously were made from a big picture perspective, like big runways, you know, running across, you know, miles and miles of things. That it's like, well, did people do that? It didn't look like it. Must have been aliens. See, that was part of the, must have been aliens picture again. The, some picture of scraped on a wall. You know, 900 years ago or 2,000 years ago, of a man with a round bubble over his head, you know, like a like a space helmet, and things like that. Well, the larger consciousness system can create anything, any physical construction that it wants to, and that construction helps us see bigger pictures. I think see? people tend to sit, to think about things in the future. Oh, there were miracles then and there were things then, but there are miracles here every day. You just have to pay attention. Oh yes. There are things that defy our sense of, of uh, what's normal all the time. It's just that we tend to ignore them. The, we don't report them. It doesn't get passed around. Um, outside of the few people who personally witnessed it, it's regarded as 
as a foolishness and just kind of passed off because it conflicts with the belief. You know, any, any um, what do we call them, true believer, you know, anybody who's really committed to a belief will dismiss anything that conflicts with that belief. And that's, you know, that's the way our science is, but that's also the way our culture is. I and think that's probably good because it, it reinforces that your individual experience is the thing that is important. It doesn't have to be believed by anyone or accepted by anybody. Exactly. I think what, where you come from is, is very much that. Mm -hmm. Individual responsibility, individual experience. The only thing that's valuable to you is your own experience. And I, I do like that about... Yeah. Consciousness yeah. is an individual thing. Mm -hmm. you know, consciousness is personal. So the only experience that's important experience to you is your personal experience. The only truth that can be your personal truth comes out of your personal experience. So that's really where it, where it is. That's the thing. And some of us are more ready than others to, to, uh, to grow and move along that, along that path. And as you've pointed out in our recent, uh, and several recent talks, that doesn't mean someone is better than someone else. No. It's simply that we are so very much individual that we are all on a certain path at a certain level. We are who we are and you need to respect everyone for where they are. I think it's very important not to make any I'm better or any judgments about that. I think that is what would bring about a true shift in peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you think about it, having a, a, um, a demonstration of something that was uh, paranormal, and paranormal just means beyond what can be explained by normal explanations, normal being uh, you know, science, the science view of the world, not the bigger science that I introduced, but the, the, little, the little science viewpoint of the world. If you thought about it, if there was some major demonstration that demonstrated to nations of people or millions of people at one time, what would be the effect of that? It would cause fear. It would cause confusion. It would cause turmoil. It would not be a positive thing. Fear, confusion, and turmoil are all high entropy things, you know. It would not be a good thing. So and if it say, well, if it wants to do a demonstration, why not just you know, have it, have it rain dimes or, uh, you know, pink flowers one day over the whole world and then the whole world would know. Well, that would not be a good idea. That would create just the opposite effect. That would create fear and confusion and all sorts of unpleasant things in the minds of people and it would not be of any value. It has to be worked, as you say, just a few people at a time. It has to be worked in the margins with individuals because that's where all the growth has to be individual. You can't, you know, it's not a mass phenomena that can be done. So it has to be kind of, you have to kind of creep up on this from the margins. And otherwise it would be counterproductive. The mass of 100 million people aren't ready for that yet. They're not going to say, oh, look, reality's bigger than we thought. You know, they can't do that because now it's this mass thing. You're going to have mass hysteria, you know, going with it. I think there are some good people out there doing experiments collectively, but on a, on a small level. Mm -hmm. John Hagelin with his experiments in reducing the crime rates in a certain area of the country. Yeah, Dean Raiden, Raiden has Raiden. some good experiments ongoing. Those and those good. experiments will, will uh, you know, people, lots of people. I mean, Dean Raiden is doing good science. You know, he's careful with what he does and his and the way he approaches his science, mm -hmm. and uh, you know those will help open minds. It'll help uh, you know people step into a bigger box as far as you know their reality goes, and it's all very good. But you'll notice that it all stays in the margins. I mean, there are, there are people who've been studying remote viewing now for the last thirty years, and studying it exhaustively. And the protocols are immaculate. You know, they're double, double blind, triple blind. And people are still having great success at viewing the targets. Well, it only has to happen one time to break the, you know, to break the rule of, of uh, you know, objective causality. 
but it happens hundreds and hundreds of times with many different people who are trained to do it. But yet, though this has been going on for 30 years and is very scientifically credible, you see, it's not credible at all in the larger society. It's still in the fringe. And they can publish papers and documents, so can Dean Radin, so can other people, but all the proof in the world is not sufficient, you see, because you're not going to convince anybody of its reality if it's not a personal experience to that individual. An individual that believes it's impossible will continue to believe it's impossible no matter how much other people say they have evidence to the contrary. So that's just the way it is. You know, sometimes people write to me and says, well, it would be great. Why don't you just do some kind of demonstration and everybody would have to believe it? No, it doesn't work like that. Everybody wouldn't have to believe it. Nobody has to believe anything. The people who were right there would maybe consider it, but even people who see it in front of their eyes often walk away and still don't believe it. They'll say, well, I don't know what kind of trick it was. I couldn't figure it out, but it must have been some sort of trick. You know, and they'll just leave it at that. It's something that has to be crept up on, individual at a time. Things like crop circles will maybe do hundreds or thousands of individuals at a time, but only people that are kind of drawn to it. Only people open enough to go click on that site and go explore what kind of science has been done there, you see. Those will be the people who will kind of then open their mind. The people who are, oh, that's a bunch of crap. They'll never go, they'll never look, they'll never read anything. They'll never, you know, they'll never go there. Here's and another quote. Winston Churchill. People will sometimes stumble upon the truth, but they'll get up and walk away as if nothing happened. Yeah. Um, is that some sort of insight into the nature of the yeah. collective yeah, humanity? The na nature of belief. The nature sure. of belief. But That's you. absolutely true. So maybe this will put a little perspective <laughs> on the, quote, weird, unquote, things that seem to go on, and the weird and outlandish claims that seem to be made, you know, uh, happening all over the all over the planet, from from UFOs to you know miraculous healings to other sorts of things, is that much of that is is orchestrated, you know, what is it, uh, you know, designed, you know, produced and uh, implemented by the larger consciousness system, just to stretch the minds of those who are ready for their minds to be stretched. Not to create panic in the streets, you know, not to force, not to slap people in the face with information they're not, they're not ready to deal with. That's counterproductive. You don't want to shove facts down somebody's throat who isn't ready to swallow. You do them more harm than good that way. I mean, some people have that idea that, oh, okay, we have these facts, we'll make everybody see it, but making everybody see it is not a good thing. You can't make somebody grow up. People have to come to it as they're ready. So that's the, that's the idea. Things are the way they're supposed to be. It's not that those stupid people out there just don't get it. They're not ready to get it yet. And you can't force feed them. But you can, like Dean Radin does. You can, you know, go do experiments. Show it. Keep stirring the pot. Keep raising up, you know, like they do in pair labs. You know, pair labs have been going on for 20 years, maybe longer. And they do these wonderful experiments that show that mind affects matter. And they have any number of people who will affect the outcome of, of physical things with their mind, the way random events get affected by mental intent. They've done it over and over and over again. On their website they say you take them all together and the, and the probability that it's just happened that way kind of by accident, that it was a, you know, it was just a, a kind of a random thing, is, is less than one in a billion. So science almost never gets values of, of uh, you know, it's one in a billion that this is a mistake, you know, that this is an error, that this is just random. It never does science that well, you know. One in a hundred is often really good, and one in a thousand is generally very good. One in 10,000, well, that's fact. Well, now they're talking about one in a billion, you see. They've done really good research, very careful research. There's much yeah. admiration for those yeah. people. So there are people out there doing it. Yes. But now if you're in the, in the pair labs, and that's Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, this is Princeton. This is a top, you know, Ivy League science engineering house. 
This is not some ragtag bunch, you know, working in their basement. This is the cream de la cream of the, you know, science and engineering uh, hierarchy. And they can't get things published. They take their work and try to get it published in mainstream uh, journals. It won't be accepted, you see. So just because you can demonstrate scientifically with name brand scientists with lots of degrees after their name from a name brand institution, as far as the larger culture goes, means nothing. Unacceptable. I think there's a book out there now that Pear Labs, the directors of the Pear Labs have finally published that tell about their work over a 30 yeah. year span. There's a, web, there's a website and you can go look at their yeah. website, you can look at their research, you, they tell you all their uh, protocols, they tell you what they did and how they built it and how they studied it and you know, every detail is there, it's open. It's not like, well, that probably was bad science. It's all there. It's good science. It's just that those who have a problem with belief, those that are trapped by their belief, have to say things like, oh, it's probably bad science, without ever really... And they'll never go look to see that, because they'd be frightened that they might turn out that it wasn't bad science. So they just say that and blow it off. And, but again, that's the same, they blow off the crop circles, you see, they blow off the healers. They blow off these things because they can't deal with that information. And to force feed it, to force them to deal with it, is the wrong approach. That won't help. That'll, de that'll increase entropy. You'll create fear. You'll create all the things that you're trying to get rid of by doing that. So that's kind of the way the world is as it is. That's why it has all of these strange things. That's why the majority don't. Why can't they see that there's these good experiments? There's these physicists and engineers and highly trained people at Pear Labs doing these things for 30 years, 20 years. And why doesn't that convince everyone? Why doesn't science look at that and say, well, see, I don't understand it, but it's a fact. It doesn't happen that way. The larger society is not ready to take that step. You can't force people to, to grow up. You have to let them get to the point where they're ready to grow up. But how do you help them? Oh, you have all these little things going on where you nudge them. You have all these little experiences that individuals have that kind of nudge them in that direction. So working at the individual level or at small groups, like the crop circle thing, the people that really pay attention to that are really a small group compared to the, you know, to the larger society. And you have these things going on, and that's kind of the, the, the bubbling of uh, bigger picture in the margins to help grow the whole thing. So that's kind of why it works the way it is. So don't, uh, don't feel like, you know, the people who aren't getting it, you know, it's not that they're, you know, something's wrong with them and we should force feed it to them. It's not, that's not good. They'll, they'll come around one day. One day when you have a large enough number of people who do get it, when that little, when that majority grows to be 60 or 70 percent of the population, the rest will fall in. But we're just, you know, it's just bubbling along for now. Well, thank you very much for this very informative and valuable interview. I know your readers will appreciate it. I do. And I hope that we will open some new people up, open some minds up, to some of the concepts you have in your My Big Toe books. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Donna.